All right, I think we have Mr. Mendoza. Hello, Madam Chair. Thank you for allowing me to present SB 270. All right, um, we're just having a little shuffle uh, of people in the audience. Thank you very much, Mr. Mendoza. And this is item one in your agenda, Court Reporters, uh, Board of California. Thank you very much. Thank you. Again. Uh, SB 270 defines the manner in which California Court Reporters Board can issue fines and injunctions for acts in violation of the Court Reporters Board professional and ethical rules for certified shorthand reporters. Under current law, the Court Reporters Board has limited authority to impose penalties on any short reporter or short reporting firm that is rendering services in California. For unlicensed entities, however, the CRB has had challenges when attempting to impose fines for ethical and or legal violations. These violations range from gift giving to a practice known as penny invoicing, in which a shorthand reporting firm will charge a penny per invoice to assist a law firm with its litigation costs while charging full price to that law firm's opposition. This, this has jeopardized the integrity of the court reporting profession and creates a disadvantage for licensed, licensed businesses that provide shorthand reporting services and adhere to the ethical and legal guidelines set by the court reporters board and the laws and statutes of the state of California. You will hear from the opposition argue that they are not shorthand reporting firms and that they should, shouldn't be subject to the jurisdiction of the CRB. If this is true, then they are unaffected by SB 270. Uh, because SB 270 only applies to individuals and firms engaging in the practice of shorthand reporting in California. If, however, it is true that they are shorthand reporting firms, then they are operating in California in violation of existing corporations and business and profession codes. The opposition has, has proposed that instead of supporting the CRB's mandate to regulate the shorthand reporting industry, the legislature should narrowly focus on the solution to, uh, uh, to violations such as gift giving. Yet, in the case of the Court Reporters Board versus U.S. Legal, the CRB did just that. They sued U.S. Legal for violations of the CRB's gift giving standards. U.S. Legal who is one of the opponents here today, could have opted to pay the fine, the $2,500 fine, and stop the unethical practice of gift giving. But instead, they argued that they were not subject to the jurisdiction of the board. U.S. Legal ultimately won the case in court. Not because they were not engaged in gift giving, not because the court thought that they were not engaged in the practice of shorthand reporting services, but because the court found that the U.S. legal was not able to legally exist in California as a shorthand reporting firm and was, therefore, not subject to the jurisdiction of the CRB. It is unclear why the opposition would object to, uh, so strongly to their bill that would only impact them if they were operating in violation of California law. If they are ethical stewards and technical, technological innovators, as they claim, they should have nothing to worry about SB 270. The goal of SB 270 is to provide the CRB with additional tools that they do not rely on increase, so, so that they won't rely on increasing fees to the 700 licensed short hair reporters who generally follow these rules. With me today we have uh, Edward, uh, Ed Howard with the Deposition Reporters Association who will elaborate on this. Also Yvonne Fenner with the Court Reporters Board and Ignacio uh, Adandis with um, and Brooke Ryan with the California Court Reporters Association. Thank you. Witnesses in support. Madam Chair, Ignacio Hernandez on behalf of the California Court Reporters Association. I'm asking to defer my time to Carlos Martinez, the current president of CCRA. Thank you. Madam Chair and members, thank you for having us here today. Uh, my name is Carlos Martinez. I am the president of the California Court Reporters Association. CCRA is the largest state association of court reporters in the nation. CCRA is sponsoring SB 270 to protect the integrity of the court reporting profession and to ensure that everyone in California plays by the same rules. A significant portion of CCRA's membership provides reporting services and depositions. In these settings, there are no judges. We are essentially an extension of the court. 
We swear in witnesses before they provide testimony under oath. We are responsible for, for providing high quality services and ultimately produce an accurate and official record of the proceedings. We are also required to maintain a level of objectivity that is guided by the professional rules of conduct promulgated by the California Court Reporters Board. To this end, we are not allowed to provide special gifts to parties, nor are we allowed to favor one party over another when we set fees. This is critical to preserve our objectivity and to avoid any appearance of impropriety. Can you imagine how parties in heated litigation involving civil rights violations or in a dispute involving millions of dollars of intellectual property would feel if we charge the opposing party double for a transcript? Would this favoritism engender a lack of confidence in the accuracy of our transcript, a transcript that will be relied upon in court proceedings? Fortunately, the California Court Reporters Board has set key parameters and restrictions to protect the industry and preserve objectivity. SB 270 strengthens the ability of the board to enforce its rules of professional conduct and to ensure that whoever is providing services in California must abide by those rules, including the need to avoid financial double dealings that would undermine the integrity of the official record of depositions. SB 270 requires all individuals and entities operating in California to follow the same rules. No one should be above the law. No one should be able to pick and choose which laws to follow. Every individual and every business entity should be following the same rules. I ask that you support SB 270 today and stand behind the California's professional standards and the ability of the California Court Reporters Board to enforce these rules. Thank you. Thank you. And support. Good morning. My name is Yvonne Fenner. I'm the Executive Officer of the Court Reporters Board. Thank you for your time this morning. Um, I'm sure that all of your staffs have briefed you on this bill very excellently, but I thought you might want a quick word from the actual body that's receiving the complaints from the consumers. Um, I want to start out by assuring you that the board in no way is attempting to prohibit business in California. The litigation market in California is a multi-billion dollar industry and there is room for all competitors there. In fact, for many, many years, large national corporations have been providing court reporting services here in California. Unfortunately, the competitive nature of that industry has um, brought forward some practices which are now outside the statutes and um, the regulations which govern the court reporting industry. This is where I am concerned and I'm sure all of you are concerned because now we have California consumers who are victims of a violation of the law but now have nowhere to turn. So we're asking you to not prohibit business, encourage business, but make sure that everyone is following the law. And I'm happy to answer any questions that the committee mem members may have. Thank you. Uh, in support. Good morning, Madam Chair. Members, Ed Howard on behalf of the Deposition Reporters Association. The um, Deposition Reporters Association focuses on representing only the freelancers who take depositions. Uh, pleased to support this bill, and I'm pleased. I was counsel of record in the U.S. Legal versus Court Reporters Board trial on behalf of my client. I'm pleased to answer any questions the committee or the chair may have on, the, on that mm -hmm. issue. Thank you. Thank you. Others in support? Oppos uh, support or opposition? Opposition. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Mike Belote, on behalf of a consortium of deposition services companies in California, including Veritex, Magna, U.S. Legal, and Esquire. Um, Senator Mendoza is a fine senator and his sponsors are fine people. I think that they um, uh, don't understand the practical impact of the dispute that's occurring here. And to begin with, I'd like to start with a uh, level set here. What the problem is that the definition of court reporting in the Business and Professions Code is very, very simple. It is the making of the verbatim record of proceedings by stenographic or shorthand machine writing. It is the making of the record. Our companies do not make the record. We hire licensed court reporters in California to make the record. But last fall, the California uh, Court Reporters Board adopted a regulation, 2403, on scope of practice. And it includes 
items within the scope of practice for depositions, including making a full or partial copy of a transcript available, or in subdivision nine, securely sealing the transcript in an envelope and mailing it to the attorney noticing the deposition. So what has happened is the court reporters board has taken a very narrow definition of the scope of practice of court reporting and expanded it greatly in the regulation. And that is where the problem is. I do not believe that these companies are in the business of court reporting. But what happens under the bill is the, the bill doesn't put a thumb on the scale in this dispute. It puts an anvil on the scale in this dispute. The bill calls for daily fines of between, uh, mandatory daily fines of between $1,000 and $2,500 per day. That, if you multiply times business days, is between $260 and $650,000 a year in fines. And remarkably, the court may also order restitution. It doesn't say restitution of what or to whom and the return of any payments made to the person or corporation. So to be clear, this empowers the court to order the return of all money paid to the company. So as this dispute unfolds, it seems to me that our companies who do not make the record have three choices. They can cease offering services in California, they can offer services but subject themselves to these ruinous and draconian penalties, or presumably they could get a license as a court reporting entity in California. But there's a problem there because Section 8044 of the Court Reporters Law says that they may not become professional corporations to offer court reporting services unless all of the shareholders of the companies are licensed California court reporters, which is not the case with respect to these four companies. So even if they decided they were offering court reporting services in California, they would be ineligible to get a license in California. So this is a regulatory catch-22 of the highest order. Now the issue that came up in Santa Clara was gifts. And it is true that there is a disequilibrium and inequity between what licensed court reporters can do in marketing in California and what our companies can do. And if I was offering court reporting services pursuant to a license in California, I would find that unfair and something that should be addressed. And I'm here to pledge to the committee that we would work to address the gift issue in a fair way. But this is not a fair approach. This is putting the thumb on the scale of the dispute, leaving four, four companies at least with no regulatory answer when they're not offering court reporting services in California. The problem is that the reg went beyond the statute and sweeps them in, and they have no remedy left. Okay. So we would work on the gift issue, but we can't do anything but oppose a bill that would take us out of California where we serve major players in the litigation environment. With me today is Dan DeLette from Esquire to answer any questions about how this system actually works, but I, uh, I would ask for a no vote. Okay. Um, anyone else in opposition? Don't see any. We'll bring it back to the com committee. Um, and. Uh, Mr. Gatto, do you want to? Res did you, yeah, I would love like to, to respond, respond to some of the things that he said. But you know, I would love to defer it to the people who are on the front lines. That way, they can answer it exactly the way it's going on right now, instead of my own interpretation. If I could defer that, uh, yeah, I don't know, take uh, a question to the board or Ignacio. Yes, please. go ahead, would, Ignacio. Madam yeah. Chair. Would you prefer that, or would you want to wait till somebody member Gatto asks this question? Um, Either please way, please respond because I think that would inform our questions. Sure, quickly. Well. Um, I have the utmost respect for Mr. Below. Uh, we have mutual respect and good, you know, high integrity. Let me clarify a couple of things. Uh, the, the statement that the entities are not providing court reporter services and to somehow limit it and, and kind of pinhole it only to the making of the transcript misses out on a key component that is regulated in California and regulated in states throughout the country, and that is getting, getting paid 
for the making of the transcript. That is what is covered by the regulations that were promulgated by the Court Reporter Board. The certain restrictions to ensure impartiality and ethical behavior related to the payment in producing the transcript and exchanging of the transcript and making copies of the transcript. That is part and parcel to court reporter services in California. In fact, in the state of Texas, where at least where some of the opponents, uh, that is their home state, there is Texas law that limits and restricts the ability of parties, or I'm sorry, of those companies that are producing the transcripts from giving, from giving favorable contracts to one party and not the other. Very similar to what the California Court Reporter Board regulations have done. So this isn't something new. This isn't something that, that is new to the opponents. It is something to ensure the impartiality and the objectivity of court reporter services in California and in states across the country. So to say that you know, I, I think it's misleading to say, well, we should only focus on who's actually making the record, but not focus on who's getting paid and how those financial arrangements are being made, that somehow that's outside of what the court reporter board should be doing. That's just simply, you know, not good policy. And, it, and it's not the law right now. And let's, let's be clear, the business I mean, model of the opponents... Wrap up. You're, sure. you're responding to a statement, so we want to sure. bring it up yeah. to the, to the sure. dais so, for questions. So. So, yeah, just to be clear, the payments, the business model, as it was explained to us, is that the corporations are the ones that negotiate the fees for the transcript. It's not the licensed court reporter. So as long as the entities that are negotiating and deciding the fees and negotiating with each party, they are subject to following the ethical rules of impartiality. Thank you. Mr. Gatto. Thank you. Um, so I'm trying to wrap my head around this bill. It's rare that in business and professions we, we get a bill that, um, that uh, isn't about something medical. And I'm just so excited as an attorney that this is one that, that I can actually speak on with some degree of credibility. Um, but I, I'm just trying to understand this bill. I mean, there's, there's a few things that are a little troubling, and I wasn't aware of the, uh, the long story leading into this. Um, I'm a little troubled by the fact that um, the legislature, um, our colleagues, our predecessors, passed this court reporting statute however many years ago that they did. I'm assuming it was well before I got here. But that the, the board then took an action which was a legislative action. I mean, that's kind of flying in the face of the legislature. Um, and I know it happens a lot these days, but, uh, you know, you, you can call me old-fashioned, but I think the legislature should create the laws and the, the executive branch, including these boards, should, should execute them, um, not not make them from, from their perspective. But, but the crux of this, what I'm trying to get at is um, you have these companies creating, creating transcripts or hiring people to create transcripts. The people who actually create them are licensed in California, right? They can lose their license if they don't make a verbatim transcript of the, um, of the proceedings. And that is the nature of the profession. It's a verbatim transcript. And I do have faith in California court reporters, having used them myself, that they have the ability and the capability and the pride in their profession to actually make a verbatim transcript. And if one company, I mean, you know, the way that law works is you have these big firms in a corporate dispute, uh, and these big firms hire thousands of court reporting firms every year. But if they get back a transcript that is not verbatim, for some way, they're, they're not going to hire that firm, win or lose. I mean, you know, the whole, the whole value is a verbatim transcript. And, I, and, but, and, and here's, here's, the other, here's the other thing that I'm trying to get. We have on one side, we have companies, and we have on the other side, different companies, but there are no attorneys here complaining that they've got some sort of improper transcript. I mean, there would be a line, you know, as deep as on that last bill if there had been some sort of problem. So I'm, I'm trying to, I'm just trying to understand that the way that this bill is worded, why, why it is worded that way. And anybody can help me out. Go ahead. Sure. Yvonne Fenner with the Court Reporters Board. It's not the accuracy of the transcript that's at issue. It is the attendant business practices that go 
into what court reporting is. Court reporting is much more than just creating the record. That record has to be distributed. It has to be distributed on a timely manner, in a fair manner. And so that's why the, the broader definition um, well, I mean, now this is new. Uh, we, we, we heard about the accuracy of the record. We heard that that was important. That was in some of the proponents' testimony. But now you're saying that this has to do with how fast they mail it out or how fast they FedEx it or how fast they transmit an electronic copy? Part of it is timeliness, that it goes out at the same time to all of the parties. That's crucial to maintaining the impartiality, um, as well as the financial arrangements that Mr. Hernandez spoke with earlier. Um, there are, I have a complaint from attorney in my office right now about what they were charged by one side versus the other side. Um, litigation is being carried free for one side while the other side is being charged um, a very high price. And so it, it really goes to the uh, um, impartiality of how they're being treated, of how the clients are being treated. Mr. Below, you want to weigh in? Well, I, I would simply refer the committee again to section 8017 of the Business and Professions Code. It is the making of the record that is the practice of court reporting. It is not the business practices. It is not the timeliness. It is not the transmittal of the transcript. It is the making of the record. So the Court Reporters Board, an honorable group to be sure, has lots of concerns, but they have adopted a regulation which, in my opinion, is not consistent with the statute. And it is been done in a way to define court reporting as broadly as they can to sweep in as many companies as they can. But it's not the statute. Right. Uh, go ahead. Uh, that regulation came about as a direct effect from the um, final ruling statement of decision in the U.S. legal CRB versus U.S. legal matter where the judge did in fact find that U.S. legal was offering court reporting services. So you disagreed with the court case and you tried to legislate Hey. No, it's so, the opposite. If, if I can bring the right. dialogue back up to the yeah. chair, please. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Gatto. I, I, sure. and, I, and I purposely gave you deference, uh, you. realizing your expertise in this area. So um, are there any other uh, questions or comments from members, Ms. Dr. Wood? Yeah, and unlike Mr. Gatto, actually, my expertise is more in the medical field. So this is, and I know nothing about court reporting. Uh, but but I, have, I have some questions. Um, Agree that the business practices may not be appropriate incentives and things like that. Totally get that. Um, you talked about complaints. How many complaints are we talking about, and what are the nature of the complaints? The nature of the complaints um, cover the gift-giving violations. They also cover the um, irregularities in the invoices, the where one side is getting a deal that the other side is not getting. So that has nothing to do with the accuracy of the record no. or the integrity of the record? Exactly. So how many complaints? Number-wise, very few. I can say it's good. It's, they basically revolve around one corporation, five. So we have very few complaints on an issue, um, and the core issue is, is the record being completed in an accurate way? No. You're, you're, no so, so, the, so the court reporting documents are not accurate? They're not? They are accurate. That's not even at issue. Okay, and that's, that was my clarification there. Mm -hmm. I guess, to me, and I would, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to agree with my attorney colleague here um, on this, it really feels like this is a legislative approach to you've broadened your regulations um, uh, to address a problem that it, it, the definition is fairly narrow, and the regulations are now fairly broad. And um, I think... I think, you, I think the bigger discussion here that isn't happening, that should be happening, is we should be talking about the definition and then building the regulations based on the definition. But you've done it just the opposite. You have a very narrow, narrow definition, and then you broaden the scope of the regulations to be able to scoop this up. And fundamentally, I, I just have a problem with that. Thank, th th thank you, Ms. Dr. Wood. Are there any other uh, comments from members? Uh, Senator Mendoza, did you want to respond to any yeah, of the I would comments? Like to, uh, add to that, because he's been on the front line dealing with the legal issue, with the, uh, pertains to this issue, so I'd love to have him. Mr. Answer. Howard, I'm, I'm, I'll, I will allow you to um, speak since Senator Mendoza deferred to you, but I would ask you to be brief and answer specifically to the comments that have been brought up by Dr. Wood. 
and not restate the previous testimony. My pleasure, Mr. Chair. I'll just Thank answer you. the question. I, the questions are related to the scope of practice regulation. The scope of practice regulation is, the, is not, first of all, the regulation was approved by the Office of Administrative Law, which reviews all regulations and approves them for their authority and consistency with current law. The second is that the scope of practice of a court reporter doesn't just include things in statute, in statute, that are in the business and professions code. The court reporter's duties are governed, for example, by many provisions in the Code of Civil Procedure, including those, co those provisions in the Code of Civil Procedure that relate to how a record is corrected and prepared. So for example, in the case with US Legal, one of the dispositive facts in that case was whereas the Code of Civil Procedure assigns to, quote, the reporter, meaning uh, Assembly Member Gatto, the reporter who transcribed the deposition, the evidence in that case showed that the reporter, after finishing the transcript, turned it over to the non-licensees within U.S. Legal's production department, and the company took it from there. So one, the scope of practice is, includes those provisions related in, in, that are required in the Code of Civil Procedure, not just the Business and Professions Code. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Howard. I appreciate that. Any other comments from members? Uh, with, with with permission of the chair, yeah. Just to follow up, um, it just feels like you know this this is really uh, should be more of a discussion about how to regulate the business model. Um, it feels like uh, something went some. Uh, it, it sort of feels like we didn't really like the the court decision, and that this is an opportunity to take a really punitive approach to force somebody out of the market. That's what it feels like. Um, and when I look at this here, I get that the the incentives may not be appropriate, but I just fundamentally disagree that taking a fairly narrow definition and broader guidelines uh, around that definition is the appropriate way to do that without more of a fundamental discussion about the definition of court reporting. So I, I'm not going to, I won't be supporting the bill. Thank you, Dr. Wood. Any other comments from members? Senator Mendoza, you may close. Thank you. Uh, again, members, this, this bill is not so much about the regulations. It's more about uh, certain outside, uh, out-of-state companies who don't want to adhere to our ethical and other legal uh, laws here in the state of California. They circumvent our laws by having contractors in our state and stepping back saying California laws do not apply to us. Thus, we could do our gift giving. We do whatever we like. And we're trying to close that loophole by allowing us to uh, allow the, the board to have more oversight on these companies and make sure they behave ethically like all the other companies in our state. Uh, with that, members, I respectfully ask for your vote. Thank you, Senator Mendoza. We are looking for a motion and a second on this bill. We have a motion. And we have a second. If the clerk, oh, it's, uh, this is uh, dual referred. Uh, so from here, it's a due pass to Judiciary Committee would be the motion. And if the clerk can call a roll. Bonilla. Jones. No. Jones, no. Baker? No. Baker, no. Bloom? Aye. Bloom, aye. Campos? Campos, aye. Chang? Dodd? Eggman? Eggman, not voting. Gatto? No. Gatto, no. Holden? Aye. Mullen? Aye. Mullen, aye. Ting? Aye. Ting, not voting. Wilk? No. Wilk, no. Wood? Would no. Senator Mendoza, you're, uh, you have three ayes, five noes. Uh, the major is on call. You have some members absent. Um, so we'll leave it on call until the end of the hearing. If at the end of the hearing it does fail, would you appreciate reconsideration? Yes, I would. Thank you. Okay, thank you. What's next? Next is Senator Morrell with uh, SB 407. This is item number three on the agenda. If Senator Morrell can come to the table and uh, members in support can present themselves at the table as well. And if there's uh, or, uh, witnesses in support, and if there's witnesses in opposition, please stand by. Senator Morrell. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Okay, um, committee members, I would like to begin by thanking 
this committee and its staff, um, especially you need Lyndon for uh, her helping us with this work uh, against uh, the opposition. I am happy to accept the committee amendments, by the way, as outlined in the analysis. SB 407 uh, adds uh, licensed midwives to the list of providers um, and practitioners eligible to participate uh, in the comprehensive uh, prenatal services program under Medi-Cal. With amendments, licensed midwives will be added to the list of providers after the medical board adopts regulations regarding their scope of practice. Uh, these midwives provide comprehensive childbirth and other things in relating to prenatal care, as well as education to their clients. Uh, SB 407 expands health care access for low-income mothers by allowing licensed midwives to provide these services to Medi-Cal recipients. Expectant mothers of all income levels should have options when it comes to deciding where and how they bring their children into this world. So SB 407 specific clarif um, um, specifically clarifies that it will not expand the scope of practice by a licensed midwife. This bill simply allows licensed midwives to provide the services to Medi-Cal recipients that are covered by the Comprehensive Services Program, which they are already authorized to provide to those with private insurance. Uh, and with me today in support is Sarah Davis with the California Association of Midwives and Jennifer Samos with the Medical Board is here to answer any of your questions regarding uh, regulations referring to these amendments. So. Uh, thank you, Chair and members of the committee. Sarah Davis with the California Association of Midwives. SB 407 will help meet the demand for Medi-Cal services for pregnant women, expand prenatal care option for families um, desiring licensed midwife services, and improve pregnancy and newborn health outcomes while controlling costs. There is agreement among the stakeholders that adding licensed midwives to the health care providers under the Comprehensive Perinatal Services Program can benefit patients and increase patient satisfaction. There has been some disagreement on a technical point, whether licensed midwives may participate in the program as a provider or only as an employee known in the program as a practitioner. We consider it critical that licensed midwives are listed as providers, as most licensed midwives are small business owners operating small, private, solo, and group practices, including birth centers. We do not believe that there is any scope of practice issue related to this bill, as licensed midwives already provide identical services to private pay families, and licensed midwives work under the scope of practice defined in statute, guided by practice guidelines adopted by the medical board. However, in the interest of accommodation and moving this process forward, we are willing to accept the committee amendments which ensure completion of prior regulations prior to the full implementation of this bill. We thank the committee and Ms. Benia for support on this issue. We are confident that the regulatory process will move forward in a timely manner and that the board will put forth appropriate um, specifications regarding all factors um, involved, including but not limited to the issue of vaginal birth after cesarean, which has overwhelming evidence in support of its safety when practiced within clearly defined parameters. In closing, licensed midwives are eager to begin serving Medi-Cal beneficiaries through the Comprehensive Perinatal Services Program. Uh, we thank you for your consideration and respectfully ask for your I vote. If I can, if, and we have a motion. Uh, if I can just go jump in real second, it'd be appropriate for the author to indicate whether uh, you're accepting the committee amendments or not. Yes, we are. Okay, great. Thank you. Jennifer Sabose at the Medical Board of California. We actually don't have a position on this bill, but I'm just here to answer any questions members may have on the regu regulation amendments. Thank you. Jasmine Gordon on behalf of the California Black Health Network in support. Um, Amber King with the Association of California Healthcare Districts also in support. That's okay. Any other uh, witnesses in support? Um, I just wanted to say I'm Tosi Marceline. I'm on the. Um, I've had a, a practice in this area for over 30 years. I was involved in the um, implementation of our licensing bill and worked with Senator Collet when we. Uh, began the process of licensing midwives in the state and it has always been the intent that licensed midwives serve everyone not just people who have the money to pay us privately and we all serve a number of of people who have no money and we give them the same kind of care we give everyone else but it limits their perception of 
who we are and limits their access when they don't know that we can serve them and take their Medi-Cal. So okay, please, I'm in support of this bill. Thank you. I think both caucuses agree in support of the bill. So if we can have uh, additional witnesses in favor of the bill, just uh, give us your name and where you're from and if you support the bill. I'm Shoshana Friedman Hawk. I'm from Berkeley, California, and I support this bill. Thank you. Uh, Megan Crank from Oakland. I support this bill. My name is Andrea Flood. I'm a student of the Claremont Colleges, and I support this bill. Teresa McLean, representing California Families for Access to Midwives, and we support this bill. I'm from Hayward. Rosanna Davis, I'm president of California Association of Midwives, and we support this bill. Deborah Gilbride, licensed midwife, Sacramento Midwifery Services. I support this bill. Renee Hannibal, certified nurse midwife. I am support of this bill. I'm Jamie Crockett of uh, Placerville, California, and I'm in support of this bill. Kim Stanford, student midwife, Sacramento. I'm in support of this bill. Thank you. Any other witnesses in support of the bill? Witnesses in opposition. If we can make a seat available at the table for... Actually, this is very quick. Okay. We've removed our, uh, on behalf of the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, we appreciate the committee and the author and the sponsors to take the technical amendment. And with that, we re remove our opposition. Oh, great. Thank you. Any other witnesses in opposition to the bill? Uh, we have a motion on the bill. We're looking for a second. We have a second from Ms. Baker. Any comments from the committee? No comments from the committee. If we, uh, Senator Morell, would you like to close? Yes, thank you, uh, and respectfully ask for your I vote. Excellent close. Uh, the motion is thank to do you, pass as amended to appropriations. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're I'm welcome. Mr. Chair. <laughs> if the, uh, I was going to vote yes, but I may have changed my <laughs> mind. Uh, the clerk can call the roll, please. Bonilla? Jones? Aye. Jones, aye. Baker? Aye. Baker, aye. Bloom? Aye. Bloom, aye. Campos? Chang? Aye. Chang, aye. Dodd? Eggman? Aye. Eggman, aye. Gotto? Holden? Mullen? Aye. Mullen, aye. Ting? Wilk? Aye. Wilk, aye. Wood? Aye. Wood, aye. Eight to zero, your measure is out. Congratulations. Thank you. We'll see you in a probes. Well.